Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to today's UMAA webinar, Black Identity in the Workplace. We're going to go ahead and get started. I know there are still a few folks that are coming on in. I um, wanted to introduce myself. My name is Steve Davis. I'm the Interim Associate Vice President of Engagement with the University of Minnesota Alumni Association. February is Black History Month and, and Career Month. And so we are excited to present this event about what it's like to be Black in the workplace. We have a powerhouse panel of alumni from different industries and experiences today to bring this experience to you. Yeah. There we go. All right, now before we get started uh, with the presentation, I would like to thank our Alumni Association members and donors for making initiatives like this presentation possible. We have a special offer for uh, Career Month participants. So if you become a member during February, there's only a few more days left, uh, you get to choose one of these U of M socks from the Minnesota alumni market as your gift. You can join us by going to umnalumni.org slash membership. As I mentioned uh, today, its webinar is part of many events that are hosted during Career Month. On Thursday, we are hosting our last and uh, signature event, uh, the Maroon and Go Connections. This is a free event for students and alumni. And so far, over 250 people are registered. During this event, you'll be able to interact with industry-based networking conversations, you'll be able to initiate three minute one on one speed networking uh, uh, with other participants, and you'll be able to hear from alumnus and motivational speaker Walter Vaughn. There's still time to sign up and you can do so by going to umnalumni.org slash career month. Career month is made possible by the many great partners that are shown on this screen. Uh, our presenting sponsor, Freedom Financial, is proud to sponsor Career Month because quality education and career development align with their mission to help everyday people move forward towards a better financial future. Their suite of financial solutions has helped hundreds of thousands of co consumers take control of their finances, reduce their debt, and get on a path to financial freedom since 2002. The UMAA greatly appreciates all of our partners who have made events like this month possible. Before we get started, just wanted to give some quick housekeeping notes. Um, for those of you that are calling over phone, you can dial in using the number that you see here. Um, and also we will be having a, a panel today. The panel will go through a, a moderated session for about a 30, 30 minutes or so. Um, and then we'll leave at least 15 minutes for Q&A at the end. If you do have questions, you can use the Q&A function uh, in Zoom and add your questions there. Uh, and we will try to get those addressed during these, this actual event. Now, next, I'm going to introduce our moderator of today's panel, and she will pass it on to the panelists to introduce themselves. So our moderator today is Tony Bennett. Uh, Tony is a 96 alumni, uh, alumna from the College of uh, Education and Human Development and is currently the director of Cloud Suite HCM with Infor Services. Tony also serves on the leadership team of the UMN Black Alumni Network, which has been in operation for about six years now. Welcome, Tony. Hi, welcome. I'm looking forward to moderating the session, everybody. Nice to meet everyone. Great. All right, let's see who we got up next on our slide. Uh, Thompson, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Sure. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Thompson Adarin Komi, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Nice Healthcare. And I graduated from CLA uh, with a BS in economics uh, in 2002 and a BA in economic and BA in statistics in 2002. I went on to get my master's degree in statistics in 2004, and then I uh, did the full-time MBA at Carlson. Uh, entered in 20, 2009 and uh, graduated in 2011. And the majority of my time, I mean, between 2009 and now, I've been working on healthcare startups the entire time. And right now I'm working on my fourth company, which is Nice Healthcare. And uh, you'll hear a little bit about that uh, a little bit later. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, Alfred, I believe you're next. Thank you, Tony. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Al Coleman. 
I'm a corporate attorney and partner at Saul Ewing, Arnstein and Lear. Uh, we're a national law firm uh, uh, with 16 offices throughout the country. I was fortunate enough to open our most recent office in Minneapolis, um, but I've certainly served uh, throughout uh, other law firms throughout the country. Um, I'm an 04 law grad uh, of Mondale Hall, a proud alumni. Um, and I look forward to the robust conversation that we'll have today on the panel. Thank you. Great, thank you. Well, Kate, who's your next? All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Wilkie Davo, College of Continuing and Professional Studies, class of 2004. Uh, currently the Director of Diversity and Inclusion for ESPN. Um, I am also a graduate of Georgetown University with a certification in uh, Strategic Diversity and Inclusion Management, as well as currently pursuing my MBA at University of Massachusetts at Amherst. So I'm glad to be here and looking forward to the conversation. Great, thank you. And finally, Anthony. Hi, good afternoon. I go by Tony and I am the social director of, uh, I can make, excuse me, social director for applied and professional studies at the College of Continuing Professional Studies. And I'm also the president of the Black Faculty Staff Association. I completed my undergraduate degree through the College of Continuing Professional Studies uh, with a degree in child psych youth studies and African American studies in 99. And I'm also a Carlson School graduate. And it's good to meet everybody. Wonderful. All right, so we'll get right into it. Again, thanks everyone. Um, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you might be. Good evening even to some people. Um, we'll just kind of jump into it. And Wilkie, we'll the first question is, um, is for you. And I know we um, had a good discussion about this earlier um, in our calls last week, but if you wanna go ahead and maybe tell us a little bit about your journey and how you were able to find your kind of unapologetic, um, empathetic self um, in the workplace, and really, if there was a pivotal moment in that process for you, can you kind of talk us through that? Absolutely. You know, I think early on in our careers, we find ourselves in, in places and spaces that either affirm that who we are authentically is valued, or we find ourselves in places and spaces where it's opposed. Um, and quickly we adjust, um, and we also start to operate or mirror what we're seeing in the workplace, right? And so for me, I think pretty early on, I recognized that, you know, that wouldn't work, right? That I found myself suffocating and, and showing up, not being who I really was, right? And, and I think that, you know, the, the amount of covering and bending to fit in places uh, that can be trying, right? And so I was about probably five years into my career and I found myself um, at a new organization, um, S.C. Johnson in Racine, Wisconsin. Ironically, out of all places is where I really found my authentic voice. Um, my mother's from Liberia. And I got a chance to visit Liberia with her in 2010. And I went and typically, you know, in true fashion, you go, you, you get your hair braided, right? It, 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 nobody braids better than people in, in Africa, right? And so, um, you know, came back and um, it was Sunday evening and I was, you know, contemplating, I just started, or I was probably a month in, um, contemplating whether or not I should take my braids out. And and this is something I think a lot of uh, women of color, black women specifically, you know, I, you know, had these conversations about our hair. And I called my, um, they put me up, they connected me with an onboarding kind of mentor. And I said, hey, you know, I just, just started, I just got my hair braided. I love my braids. I got them done in Liberia. You know, should I take them out? She was like, oh, she was like, we have, we do business in Ghana. No one's thinking about that. We're your braids, right? So I get to work the next morning and, you know, my hair is braided and my, my colleagues just were in awe of the hair and asked me about the trip. And, and I wore my braids for about a month and a half. And when I took them out, they were all upset that I took my braids out. Right. And so for me, that was, that was pivotal in, in a kind of a cue that I was in the right place, but you know, that doesn't happen unless I show up with my hair braided. Right. And for me, um, it was a lesson in, you know, not compromising in, the, in kind of the friction, right. Of kind of what we think, an organization will, will tolerate, if you will, and accept, and then who we really are, right? And so, you know, um, that was a really um, important message for me as a young black woman, in my, black woman in my career, that, you know, who I was, um, was, was perfect, right? And who I am, you know, all, all the things that I bring into the workplace need to be valued and accepted. 
And again, ironically, that started in Racine, Wisconsin. And so since then, for me, um, I've asked myself when I'm, if I'm considering new opportunities and, and, and having conversations with organizations, can I be authentically who I am? And if I can't be, it's not the right place for me, so. Wonderful, thank you for sharing. Al, I know we talked on Friday, you, you had something similar that you wanted to kind of share with the group and maybe kind of expand on what, um, uh, what Wilkie talked about. Absolutely. Um, again, this is such an important conversation uh, to have because many people are struggling. Many, many professionals of color are struggling with this issue, right? Who am I and how do I show up in the workplace? Uh, I would start by just saying, you know, it's, it, there's a journey for each and every one of us, right? You have to find your identity. And for me, you know, similar to Woki, um, I have uh, parents of African descent, you know, first generation. I was the first lawyer in my family. So I didn't know how to navigate those spaces, right? I, I started off at a top 10 law firm here in town where there was a lot of legacy professionals who knew how to walk, dress, speak, act the part. Everything for me was new, um, whether it was how to dress for meetings, um, you know, certainly you wore a suit, but, you know, I didn't know that, you know, there was truly a dress code, the, the navy blue or the charcoal gray. Um, and I remember being in meetings where I had, you know, more vibrant colors and having partners in the firm, you know, take jabs or take cracks at what I was wearing. And I just didn't know better, right? Didn't know how to dress for success. You know, one of the other things was I didn't have you know, my, my principles or moral compass fully founded at the time, right? And again, I, for those in the audience, what I want to share is that it's okay if you're still on that journey, right? Knowing what you will stand for and knowing what uh, values you're willing to compromise. So one example um, was for MLK Day, um, and this was, you know, 15, 17 years back, it wasn't at least viewed as a firm holiday. So I had to decide for myself, is this something that I'm going to take time off for? And there was a lot of pressure as a young associate, you know, you had to bill your hours, you had to hit your hours. And I felt as though if I took time away from the office to do something that was near and dear to my heart, it would be viewed negatively. Here's the point. How you started on that journey is certainly not how you will finish. So today, the way I show up and present in the workplace it, it, there's very little compromise in, you know, beliefs that I hold near and dear. So, you know, probably, you know, eight or nine years ago, you know, with a young family, we started taking the opportunity to do a day of service for MLK, right? This is a small example, but something that has power in how you show up and how your identity presents in the workplace. For me, the sacrifices that were made by our ancestors, by those who came before us, to allow me the opportunity to work in those professional spaces needed to be honored. And rather than do a day of service and keep it hidden, I decided to come back to the office, you know, obviously on an annual basis and share those experiences, share pictures, talk about why that was so important to me, no different than what my Jewish colleagues would do for their high holy days. So for those who are in the audience, again, I would just encourage you to give yourself grace, recognize that how you show up um, as a, a new graduate, as a newly minted professional, certainly will not be how you show up, hopefully over time, as you, uh, you know, start to better understand your identity and how you want to present in the workplace. Wonderful, thank you. Thompson, any additional thoughts? Yeah, thanks everybody for sharing those experiences. And, you know, for me, one of the things I noticed right away in corporate, sorry for that background noise, it's COVID, right? Everybody's got a kid at home, so, or at least I have children at home. You know, so, um, you know, for me, like I entered the workforce and I didn't see anybody like me. And I didn't mind, it didn't rub me the wrong way. You know, I went to the U of M, you know, in the late nineties, you know, so nothing new, nothing fresh there. Uh, but what really got me was there's no people in leadership that looked like me or that looked like anybody else. I didn't see anybody native. I didn't see any Hmong people. You know, I didn't see anybody, you know, in leadership. And it really irritated me. And I saw very young people who looked the same progressing very quickly. And I'm from the healthcare industry. 
you know, so I, as a young person out of college, I was very decisive. Like I didn't, I didn't take crap. I didn't, I didn't accept the systems for as, as they were. I, in my first job, I told my manager's manager's manager that they need to fix this situation for me or I'm leaving in a month. Like I just, I just told them, I, I had a PowerPoint presentation. I told them what needed to happen and they didn't do it. So I left and I quit and I went to another place to get a job. And right away, I realized early in my career that there are some people that have privilege. Like, I mean, back then we didn't really talk about it that much. There's no, I, I mean, I don't, I didn't know the, what white privilege was, you know, you know, when I was an undergrad or even when I was in graduate school, you know, but I was getting the sense of it, you know, in my early careers in the, in the early 2000s. And so I just didn't accept anything as, as fact. And I would just encourage all of you, especially the young people that are with us today, don't accept things as fact, don't accept the systems. In my next job that I quit because I quit, you know, that other job that they didn't do what I wanted to do. And they said, look, like we have a long interview process, takes about a month and these are our salary bands. And I said, you're gonna hire me tomorrow and you're gonna pay me this because I'm the best person that you're gonna to find to do this job as a statistician. And they said, no, 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 we can't do that. This is a big company too, one of the big health insurance companies. No, we can't do that. We have HR policies, we have rules, we have all this kind of stuff. And I was like, okay, all right. And guess what? They called me that night and they said, all right, we're gonna give you the job tomorrow. And yeah, we're gonna pay you outside the salary band, even though we don't do that. And then again, I got promoted three times in 11 months at this company. Cause I told them, I told them I'm the best. You have to believe you're the best and you are the best. You have to believe it first though. You know, I told them I'm the best and they promoted me three times in 11 months. But then I hit this ceiling where I was the only black manager in a company with over a thousand people. Like the only person with direct reports. And I was only 27 and I, and I could feel it. I could feel that they, they just couldn't move it to the next level. And even though all signs are pointing that they should, and I, and I, so I didn't accept it. What did I do? I quit. I quit and I went and got my MBA instead. You know, cause I said, okay, I'm going to get, I'm going to get another master's degree. Maybe if I have two master's degrees, then this kind of stuff won't happen to me anymore. And guess what? There's no number of degrees or letters behind your name that's going to stop it from happening. That's what I learned. And I don't regret getting an MBA, but I kind of entered the program in anger, you know, for, with a very angry reason for an angry reason. But again, young people on the call, you know, particularly people from underrepresented communities, the first step I believe in your journey is just realize that all these rules, all these traditions, all these ways of doing things, somebody made it up and they made it up for people that are not like you. And you have to, you have to push back. Don't accept no for an answer. Wonderful, thank you. And um, I, I feel, you know, as, conversations are happening and there's more discussions about what you're talking about in today's world. Um, I think the unconscious bias of how people hire and um, how people see themselves and others um, is a real thing. And I think um, challenging those norms um, and, and showing your worth and um, is I think a very important step as you, as anybody moves forward in their career. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm later in, in years, I think I'm probably the oldest person on the panel. Um, are pretty close. And, you know, I think I still struggle with that today at, at my role and understanding, you know, how to, to how to move forward. Um, Tony, I know, Tony too. Um, <laughs> I know you have some thoughts about this too, but I want to kind of maybe ha have you bring that into our next question as well. And obviously address the points that you have for the first and then tie those in, which is really about how has that discovery process of learning kind of your value or your, you know, your value proposition how has that impacted how you show up at work? I think we've talked about it a little bit earlier with Alfred, um, and but how have you showed up at work, and you know how have you shown that through your success? If you want to go through that uh, for us, please. All right, thank you. All right, thank you, Tony. And you're probably not the oldest. I just turned 51 this week, and so I feel good. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, but how I turn up, how I show up at work, um, the learning process for me. Honestly, I'm still learning. I'm still learning at 51. It hasn't been an easy road. Um, sometimes you have the imposter uh, complex that you feel like, how did I get here? Do I deserve to be here? Um, what am I bringing to the organization besides my blackness? And so I had to realize, you know, I bring with me a history of people who have conquered, who have survived, who have 
bled and who have cried and who have overcome to be where we are today. And so I bring with that with me to work. And so that's what gets me up in the day. That's what makes me realize, you know what, I am special. I'm valuable to this organization because of my history, to, because of my ancestors. Um, and this is coming from a person that grew up in a single parent household who was um, from another state who moved to Minnesota and being darker than a lot of the other kids that were hanging out with and being picked upon because of that and recognizing, you know, what, this, the, the skin that I have is beautiful. And so it's taking me a long time to get to this journey or to get to this place in my journey. Um, it's taken me a long time because like I said, I wasn't seeing, like Thomas was mentioning, seeing other people in your space that look like you. Um, I recall being in an organization and telling them what I wanted to do. And they were saying, no, that's not what you want to do, Tony. You really want to do something else. Because uh, I want to be an example and want to work with young black men. They said, no, you might really want to work with everybody. And I said, well, no, I have an idea who I am and what I want to do. And so when you told those things, you kind of internalize that, internalize those, and you don't actually live up to who you can be until discover like, no, what you were told as a young person, those aren't truths, those aren't the real facts. And so, like I said, I'm still on this journey, I'm still learning, and so that's a little bit uh, how I feel. Wonderful, thank you. Wokey, any additional uh, thoughts on that or any uh, perspectives that you might have for that one? Absolutely. You know, I think um, there's so much at stake when you have to you have to bend right to to fit in places. People of color spend 25 to 30 percent thinking about how they fit in the workplace. Right. When you think about the, the toll on your, your well-being, your mental health, right, 25 to 30 percent of your time thinking about whether or not you fit. So that means that you only have 70 percent left of that time to really have the impact and have the great experiences and the promise of being successful in the workplace, right? Um, another quick, as a DNI person, another quick stat, you know, uh, employees that feel a sense of belongingness, right? They, they, they produce five to three times, five to, to 10 times more than their, than their peers, right? Because again, you, you belong, you, find, you have found your tribe, right? And so I think it is, you know, to Tony's point, it's a constant journey, right? I think as people of color, again, there's so many things that are firm, you know, as of late, our black identity and, and our value, but you know, that's fairly new. So for many of us, you know, that are in some of these places now, you know, the way we show up, we have people that are behind us that are watching, right? I, I'm always mindful, you know, as the head of DNI uh, for ESPN, when I show up in a, an NFL draft meeting, right? What am I saying to other black women that look like me? Yep, it's okay to show up your authentic self with your head wrapped, right? It's okay to, you know, have a voice, have a perspective and be valued because of the ideas that you're bringing to the table, right? And so I just, I think it's important that, you know, we all have to push to, to Thompson's point, push the envelope and, and, and kind of break down these systems that have affirmed certain things that have been counter to who we are and our, our ability to succeed in, in certain environments, right? And so push, poke, ask questions, change the norm and, um, you know, help us all, you know, we're all clearing paths for people that come behind us, right? And so that's, that's where I am right now in my career. I wanna clear the path. So the next woman that looks like me that shows up to a meeting with her head wrapped, they saw that five years ago. So it's nothing new to them, right? And so I think that's, you know, we all wanna leave places and spaces better than what we are, especially as people of color, especially as black executives, black professionals, it's important. Exactly, wonderful. Thank you for sharing. Um, we, the, the head wrap uh, came up on a call we were uh, talking earlier last week, and um, I was, I was uh, for those backgrounds, uh, we were talking about hair and um, what that means and, you know, when I wear my hair curly and when I don't. And um, I think it's a lot of times the, the pressure of, you know, I'm in a male-dominated um, field, um, being in an, and worked for a big uh, top form consulting firm and, you know, how I presented myself and had a conversation with a colleague about her curly hair. And, um, you know, it, 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 to the point of uh, what Tony said, you know, you kind of are always on this journey. I could, I could be very honest and say probably within the last five years of my work journey, I've been more comfortable wearing my hair, as simple as that sounds, is, is how I want to wear it. If I want to wear it straight, I wear it straight. If I got braids, I'm going to wear braids. I think it's just a journey. So I think what we're, we're all saying is you have to push the envelope a little bit as you get comfortable doing that and, and find your place. But to understand those norms obviously um, aren't something 
that are set up by us, right? And so that you have an opportunity to push those as we move forward. So uh, great conversation. Um, we have a, one more question uh, before we break down into some Q&A. Um, and we've kind of talked about some of this already. So, um, you know, we realize that there's many students and, and alumni and community members on this call who, um, and I've kind of mentioned already, who might be one of the only few, right? Depending on where you work or what you do, one of the only few, or maybe the only, uh, you know, a person of color in your work environment, right? And that's a very similar situation that I've had most of my career, up to the point that there's been limited women of color in any leadership position uh, for me. And I guess, uh, Thompson, we'll start with you of what kind of strategies can you share to maybe help that helps you kind of navigate those situations? I think we've talked about it a little bit already. Um, or um, what did you do to maybe feel more connected, maybe more connected at work or more connected in your community or outreach to kind of help you um, in the space that you are today? Yeah, for me, <clears throat> you know, back when I was just getting my career started, LinkedIn was just coming live. You know, not many people used LinkedIn, you know, in 2006, 2007. I, I was an early adopter of LinkedIn. And so one thing I encourage people to do is to be an early adopter, you know, of, of organizations, of groups, of technology, of gathering places, because it's very, it's very difficult when things get crowded you know, to get noticed. I mean, I don't know about you, but every day on LinkedIn, I get ads in my in email inbox and LinkedIn, people reaching out to me that, you know, they don't have anything in common with me. So, you know, if you can search out those early things that haven't fully matured, give them a chance and bring people along with you. And the, the, very, the nice thing about doing that is you, you typically find more progressive, more innovative people, you know, who are also adopting the new thing or also you know, making themselves available in the new spaces, whether it's a new group or new organization. Not that I have anything against old organizations or old platforms. It's just, it's a little bit more, it's a little bit more difficult to, to connect uh, once things get really big. So that's something I did right away very early in my career. Uh, another thing I did early in my career is I connected with leaders. I mean, I remember at one company uh, that I was at, very large company, uh, the CEO was like someone you'd never talk to. Like he, he and the executive team had an office on a different floor. No one could go there. It was like, you know, some secret palace. You know, you couldn't even email him, call him. And, but I, I just emailed him. I was just, hey, like Mr. CEO, like, can we meet? Can I, can I, can I, can I learn from you? I'm a young person trying to learn about my career. And like, I emailed him and I found out from other people that he wasn't going to meet with me because it was like so audacious that I had done that, that people all over the company we're talking about it, but I didn't care. So I just kept doing that with different leaders and some people say no, some people say yes. But again, you have to remove fear from your life and you have to reach out to people who maybe you are afraid they'll say no. Maybe you're afraid they won't value you or your time, but you have to realize that you are valuable and really 99.9% .9 of people actually wanna help. Like it doesn't matter their gender, their race, their age, like they do wanna help, they might not have time you know, but they do want to help. So you got to ask everybody. That's a wonderful one. Thank you very much. Uh, Alfred, I know you have some thoughts about this one as well. Yeah, so, I mean, look, I, I'm beyond humble to be a part of this panel, just hearing Thompson's statements about, you know, just having audacious goals, right? And just having an audacious approach to life. Look, the greatest uh, gift I can leave to those in the audience I, I would encourage you to play offense, especially if you're a person of color. You know, Wokey spoke to the statistics of how often, how exhausting it is to navigate your professional spaces defensively, wondering if you belong here, great imposter theory, wondering if you're dressed appropriately, are you communicating effectively, et cetera, et cetera. And when you hear bold statements from all the panelists, what we're really encouraging you to do is to show up. Show up as who God called you to be. Your history matters, your traditions matter, you know, your, your thoughts matter, and more importantly, you matter, right? So for me, what, what was the most impactful thing in my young career was the cliched saying, you know, representation matters. I remember going to the home of young black partners here in Minneapolis, right? Law partners. 
And to that, you know, up until that point, I had never been in the home of successful attorneys, right? Or black attorneys, I should say. I went to a number of my white partners, certainly learned a ton from them, but I couldn't see myself in them. And it was so refreshing to be at this young partner's home. And I kid you not, he was rocking out to Mary J and then his playlist switched to Rick Ross and he's just hanging out, having a good time. And for the first time in my professional career, early career, I thought I could do this, right? Because the great imposter theory is real. Up until that point, I really thought someone would walk into my office and say, hey, we figured it out. You really don't belong here. You got to run, right? And, you know, like the movie Heat, you know, I'd say, well, it was a good run. I had enough time. You know, I had a little fun, made a little coin. So be it, right? For all of those in the audience, I would just encourage you when you get to the point, right, um, where you are living your truth and speaking your truth, show up so that others can see you because that really does matter, right? Uh, a quote one of my very good friends and mentor left with me. He, he said, look, when you're hired, right, as a person of color and you're brought into these spaces, you're hired for what you bring to the table. So if you're hired to be the brother or the sister in the room, be the brother or be the sister in the room. They, you, your organization already has someone with skill sets that you may be trying to emulate. So I'll break it down and make it plain. I grew up in the Midway area, right? I'm not from Edina, I'm not knocking anybody who is, but that's not my reality, right? So if I come into my space and I show up professionally, as a black man who has the trappings of success from the West Metro, that's not authentic, right? But I can speak to instead the, the opportunities, the vibrancy, the competency that comes from black and brown communities, not only in the Metro area, but across the country. You know, there are a number of communities that are underserved waiting for us to show up, right? I'll, I'll, I'll just make a quick example. When I started practicing, it was not cool to uh, look to black operators of businesses, black private equity uh, operators and owners, people who controlled money and pools of funds. They were overlooked and underserved. And there was a number of us that just showed up and said, hey, if nobody else will do your work, we will, right? And now, that's all the rage, right? You're hearing of these funds being stood up, you're hearing of the importance of investing in black and brown businesses, right? So again, the point is somebody had, the, had to have the courage to show up and say, I'm gonna be me. I'm gonna speak my truth. I'm gonna speak to those who understand me and whom I understand as well. And when you do that to me, that is the rich tapestry of diversity. That is what we're speaking to, but you gotta make your talents, you gotta bring your talents to bear, right? And don't, don't sit on it, don't be scared, don't be nervous. You know, God's got you. You can do this. Wonderful. Tony, can Thank I you. Real quick as well. Just Absolutely. real quick. Uh, just getting on this thing about representation. Uh, before I was in my role, in my current role, I was an academic advisor for my college. Uh, I think I've been one of the only black male advisors in our college for uh, many, many years. And I was meeting with a student for another program. And a black male student, he came up, he shook my hand. He said, I have not had any black advisors here at the University of Minnesota. So I need to shake your hand. I appreciate what you're doing. So representation does matter and they're watching. Agreed. I mean, and I, and I think that's a, that's a big point um, is as you move through your career, um, you know, I wish I was as bold as Thompson was when I was younger um, or earlier in my career. I wish I would have thought of it. I, I think sometimes I just got lucky of where I worked and, you know, be, me being who I was and obnoxious and loud um, you know, crazy little blackout, I, it was accepted anyway, because I got the work done, right, so I brought myself who I wanted to be, uh, but I also, you know, was strong enough to get my work done, so I commend you on that. I know, Wolke, I saw you touch your computer, so I'm, I'm assuming you got some thoughts over there that you wanted to share? No, I'm just, I'm just inspired, right, there's been so many nuggets that have been shared on this, on this, on this platform, on this, in this meeting, and I just, I, you know, there are times and, and you're going to find yourself in places and spaces where there are people that don't look like you right and so i know in an earlier call we spoke to, to see it is to be it 
and know that, you know, um, it's important to tap into networks, tap into, you know, communities outside of your own community to be able to really, really get that inspiration that you need to be able to show up in these places and spaces and, and be your best self, right? And I love that the notion, Alfred, in playing offense, not defense in your workplace. Yeah, that was wonderful. Great. All right. Um, I think we're almost at time. Um, Stephen, I know I've, I've seen some questions pop up in the chat. Um, we have some time to go through some of the Q&A. So if we want to kind of go through some of those. Yeah. And for the audience members, uh, if you have questions, please start adding those to the Q&A function and we will try to address as many as we can. Uh, thank you so far. This has been an amazing panel. Uh, I think the first question and a theme of this question is very similar to what we're talking about as far as the journey and what that process looks like to become that authentic, authentic self in the workplace um, and the fear of being in Thompson's uh, regard, going and speaking on what you want and claiming that, how do you do that and what do you say to those folks who are afraid to get to that point right now? Like, how do we get to that journey to overcome those fears in order to uh, and live in it? I think panels like this help empower us and give us that energy to want to motivate ourselves to continue to have these conversations. But it's a process. It's a journey, as, as, as Tony said. So, you know, if you guys can maybe touch on, you know, what that looks like to get to that to that point for each, maybe for each of you or just some encouraging thoughts for the audience. Look, I'll, I'll jump in and quickly chime in so we don't get people fired if they're listening to us, right? Uh, look, if you're going to show up as your authentic self, be good, if not be great at what you do. Because all these faces that I see on this screen, you know, represent that greatness in their respective communities, right? I, I know of Wokey's work. I know she's one of the best in the DNI space, period, hands down. Thompson spoke into his excellence, you know, in, in his field. So be, be so great that they cannot ignore you, right? So before you start showing up as your authentic self, make sure you understand your organization. Make sure you understand your role inside and out. Make sure you understand office politics and how this may play out, right? I'm not saying it's going to impact or affect how you go about your business and how you show up, but you'll understand where the snares are, where the traps are. And when we talk about the representation, that's having a mentor, having a sponsor. They don't need to be within your organization. The, the, the brothers and sisters that I looked up to in the law game, they weren't in my organization. Usually, and we spoke to this already, we're usually one of one, or at least one of a few. Right. So you need to build those networks outside of your organization to, to be able to, to benchmark, right? And say, well, if I do this or if I try to navigate in this manner, what will the reaction be? And at some point, you will arrive at at least a better place where you can be more true to who you are. And at that point, your greatness will supersede any external trapping that someone may try to use against you. So if Wokey shows up with her head wrap right now, she can't be fired. She's too good. She's too important to the organization for something so trivial to get in the way. But if she's doing subpar work, then that just becomes one of several issues from an HR perspective to see her out of the organization. So be so great that they can't ignore you. That's my answer. Anybody else want to share some thoughts on that? Alfred and myself grew up together in church. So the check clear. So thank you for all of that, that love you just showed. I appreciate that. No, I'll just, I'll double down on that. I think, um, you know, for many of us, we're first gen uh, professionals in the workplace, right? Our parents work very different type of jobs. And so there's a different set of tools and resources and knowledge that our peers are walking into the, the work first day with, right? And so I think there are headwinds that we have to be honest that we will face in the workplace recognizing that and knowing that there's some things that we're going to have to do differently right and some um late night preparation and and again early on activating mentors and sponsors so people can clear paths who can understand how they clear paths and, and you can get behind them and also clear those paths but that said i think it's important to just recognize the unique 
you know, kind of way we're in from a, a generational perspective in the workplace. We're coming with different sets of skills, but for many of us, right, we're the first to do this. And so the blueprint, you know, we have we didn't get it from our, our parents, right? And so we are we're stepping in first. And you know, again, there's gonna be headwinds that come with that. Yeah, I, I agree with that too. Um, a mentor a long time ago said to build your board, right? Who are your, your board members that will help you? You know, your friend, maybe you have a friend board and then maybe you have a career board, right? And all those players who sit around the table have very different roles and responsibilities on that board. Um, but they, you know, find that board, develop a board of who is your community, who are your people that you will need to look to, and they can come in all different shapes and colors. They can be men and women, um, but really understanding kind of what that board is, and you can replace players and, and, and move board members around as needed, um, but just, you know, if, it, if you're uncomfortable with the mentor thing, um, you have to kind of get out of that, because, you know, as, as a community of people, um, I didn't probably start growing into my career until I really looked at who's around me um, and who can I leverage um, to, to, to make myself better, right, personally and professionally. And so looking at it as, as you need your own community, your own board, um, and, to, and, and how those people um, relate to you and letting them know that they're on your board is kind of key so that everybody has an understanding of what, what is your responsibility. And I would say for the women um, in the in the room, um, we have a, you know, be it a, a person of color or not, um, we are at a, a slight disadvantage sometimes. And so you really need to build that board with strong um, people around you um, and, and make sure that you're inviting other men into your board too, right? If you just have a women's club, um, we only see ourselves and have conversations about women's things, but you sometimes do need a male perspective, especially in business, to kind of help you better understand what path to take or how to uh, construct a conversation about your needs. So just kind of uh, don't limit your board to people that just look like you will be doing the opposite of what, you know, what our, our, you know, we are kind of concerned about at this time. So make sure that you're inclusive in your board and you, you really find members who um, can help you grow and are there to, to help you and versus kind of push you down. Really quick ad, I just want to do a, give a shout out to the Alumni Association. I think you know, when you, it's the networking and the building those, that community starts now, right? It starts for those of you that are on the call that are still an undergrad, like, you know, tap into the alumni association, tap into the, the other groups that are part of the alumni association, University of Minnesota Black Alumni Network, right? It's important that you, do, you establish that community, community now. A lot of the opportunities that I've been afforded came through connections and friends in college, you know, uh, that were able to help me expand my network with your own network. So just, I want to, I would love to see more of that within, this, within the University of Minnesota community. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, we all talk to talk about community and finding that support system and, and it's, it's very important. And I guess another question to, to kind of piggyback off of that is thinking about this in the workplace, knowing that, you know, most of the times, if, if not 90% of the time, we're like the only in our space but there are some workplace affinity groups and Anthony, Tony, you, you know, for, for sure, you know, as being the president of the black faculty and staff association, you know, how that operates, you know, what do you think is, uh, what, what is helpful about those groups? How, how can they be supportive for, for someone in these spaces to try to find and be a part of? Um, well, one is just that connection. You have people that, uh, will speak either a common language or have a common uh, uh, history, uh, common music they may listen to. Uh, so there's that commonality there. But there's even within our group, though, there's lots of differences. So we don't all listen to the same music. We don't all listen to the same or, or like the same people. But just having that, that commonality right there is something that I enjoy with having our affinity group. But hopefully you're taking that dough and you're trying to move that group to another level, move that group so that you're supporting one another, whether it's, okay, well, there's this job or they're hiring at this position. I think you'd really be, be really great at it. Or, or well, it's not, let's figure out how we can help you get promoted within your organizations. Let's look at what skills you need to develop so that you're getting promoted and you're getting noticed. So those are some of the things that I look for within our infinity groups. Um, okay. Another question. Go ahead, Tony. 
Oh, Sorry. I would just say another opportunity is if you don't have an infinity group, um, see if you can start one at your organization. Um, the ones that I've been part of, sometimes they're great and sometimes, you know, they're just like any other group. They 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 go by, I guess, as, as quiet as they want to be. Uh, but if you, you know, it's also a good way within your organization to kind of work together to present options to the organization of what you might be looking for, for representation, for other things. Um, so that you have a collective voice going to um, maybe the higher ups. It's, it's, a, it's a nice way to do that, that there's a group of you kind of coming up with some strategic initiatives or strategic ideas for the organization, even if it's that we do more um, you know, outsourcing events or some type of events that, um, that affect your you know, community of color that you could do locally. So uh, think of it as an opportunity to also get your voice heard um, within your organization, um, especially if there's not one today. Absolutely. Can I just can I just add to that real quick? Sorry, everybody. I'm going to do it. I'm one of those panelists. I apologize. You know, so but I, I really want to tie it together. You know, it for me, I found also there's another type of affinity group. And it gets to what Alfred was talking about, if an affinity group of excellent people. And I did this at almost every place that I worked before I started my own companies. You know, usually you're about the same age, same career stage, same life cycle stage. And if you just keep close with the people who are excellent within your organization and you all know each other and you work together and you promote each other and then you push each other's excellence i'm not talking about so it's it, it could be white black brown you know everybody could be in there you know but if you if you form those types of groups of excellent people and then you are bringing you're representing yourself and us in that group of excellent people that's what brings everybody forward and I found those types of groups to be incredibly powerful, but specifically in corporate America, for-profit corporate America, because that's where my experience lies. Great, thanks, thanks for sharing. So now I'm gonna um, bring up a question that's, that's in the, from the audience that kind of turns the page a little bit. I think, you know, really thinking about this in perspective of the outside world and we're, taking on a lot of the, the, the burdens and, and things that are happening around us and bringing it at and trying to be our authentic self in the workplace, um, knowing that the, the trial of George Floyd is coming up next month, how does that reflect on how you bring yourself to work? Um, what have those conversations been like? Uh, I know that every organization has had a lot of these conversations as of late, um, some of them are awkward, some of them are needed. Um, but I think to the point of the question is like, what does that look like? Um, you know, and we we understand this question in regards of like this is this is nothing new, right? We we see this cycle happen time and time again. Um, but I think really taking that and knowing that we spend a majority of our time at work, how do you use that to keep you going? So it's a very, very deep question, but I appreciate all of your perspective on this. It's been hard. It's been times when I want to just say, hey wife, let's pack up the bag. Let's get the next flight to a place that's more representation representative of us. So let's go to Africa or someplace like that, <laughs> just to, to leave this behind. But what kind of keeps me here is knowing, again, the struggle that our ancestors went through, that this is our country. This is our country as well. And so we built up this nation. And because we built up that nation, this nation, we have value and we have worth here. And so this is what keeps me um, going after the consuming everything in the news that, that continues to like perpetrate or perpetrate uh, the negativism in our community. And so I'm like, we're, we're more than that. And so I, that keeps me going. So I'll, I'll just quickly chime in because this is far too complex. I think we'd all agree for the time we have remaining. I'll speak to those who, you know, especially who are in our community, right, our local community. The conversation certainly didn't start with George Floyd. 
right? And that's what I try to remind my colleagues. I mentioned we have 16 offices at my firm. Uh, we've got a smattering through the Northeast. So Boston, the DC, we've got Chicago, we've got Miami um, and South Florida in general, just to give you uh, the context for which I was having these conversations where people sat. And what I did was try to, you know, share with my colleagues a couple things. One, you know, we, we have some really challenging issues to put it lightly around race in this country. And unfortunately, a lot of times when these tragedies happen, whether it was Philando Castile, you know, and Alton Sterling, and then fast forward to a George Floyd, we bear that burden going back to Wokey's 30%, you know, going back to my comments about not playing defense, play offense. I stopped trying to have answers for my colleagues, right? I stopped trying to explain thoughts, feelings, and emotions and started asking them what were they willing to do to help effectuate change. Now, for many, there was no response. And I don't mean in the moment talking. I mean, an email where they're checking in, hey, how are you doing? And I would say, I'm exhausted. I don't have an answer for you, but I'm curious, what, what would you suggest is the solution, right? And so part of this authenticity that we're speaking to is you know, being free or having the license uh, to heal personally, right? Or introspective, you don't have to be on, you know, uh, on blast, if you will, right? Mm -hmm. to, to explain for an entire community. When we speak to this burden of being one of one or one of a few, we find ourselves, I believe, too often in the position representing the race. And that is terribly exhausting, right? And I remember talking to several of my colleagues throughout our firm who are African-American who spoke to that challenge. Now, if you couple that, as we all recall, you're living through a pandemic, you know, for those with young families, you're trying to navigate childcare issues. If you had elderly parents, you know, you may have had challenges there, you know, they're high risk. So my point is that was, that was so much to go through to then layer on the responsibility of helping another community navigate. It's okay, I'm here to say, it's okay if you thought this is too much and you wanted to deal with that on a more personal level. Really really quickly in this space, in the place that I'm in, right? Um, I think this work is really strongly tied to our employees as well as our content, right? Much of sports is black culture, right? And so, I think there was um, really quickly, you know, uh, the DNI work, DNI movement came out of the civil rights movement, and Black employees, uh, we'll speak in the context of cor corporations, organizations, have been left behind in this work in this movement, right? And so, the burden of having to help organizations fix their DNI issue or their Black issue is taxing, right? And so I'll be honest with you, I think for a lot of DNI practitioners, a lot of DNI leaders, um, you know, time was up, you know, and because there had been so much surface level work that had been done, we hadn't gotten to the deep rooted systemic racism, bias, discrimination that exists in our processes that existed in how we bring people in the organization, how we promote, how we evaluate people's talent, right? And so I think, you know, um, we are, I, I'm proud to say that I, my organization has, has kept our foot on the gas, um, but you know, I'm also very mindful that come May 25th, 2021, employees will be looking to say, okay, what has happened in the last year, right? And I think that's a question we all have to ask ourselves in the place and spaces that we occupy, right? For your organization, for yourself, what have I done in the last year to, to move this work forward? What, have, what has my company done in the last year to move this work forward? Um, but I think the, the onus, can no longer be on black people to solve these issues that are, are so American and deeply rooted in how we operate as a country. And I think George Floyd, it was important that it happened in Minneapolis, to be quite honest with you, because I think any place else, um, it would have been expected. We saw, I mean, this is, this, again, it didn't start with George Floyd, but I think having it happen in a city that is liberal, that is supposed to be progressive, um, I think really shed a light on, you know, the, the window dressing of race in America, right? And so I'd say for my, my own personal scorecard, right, is how, how have I moved ESPN 
content employees forward in the last year, right? And so I think we all, you know, um, to Steve's point, in a month we'll, you know, we'll be in the thick of the trial. You know, I think these conversations, you know, still have to be had and, and we all need to, again, keep our foot on the gas. I could speak to it from a different point of view. Uh, being the CEO of the company, I found myself in a, I guess, in a conundrum because every other CEO, all my colleagues were posting on LinkedIn and Twitter, all these statements, you know, after the murder, you know, of George Floyd, it was like, it was like in some CEO handbook, you know, that you're supposed to do it. And, and I didn't do it. I didn't write a post. I didn't write a poem or a letter. I didn't say anything to my staff, even to my company, you know, uh, for some days, I think it might even been a week, because I was just reflecting on it uh, myself. And I, I told my company that it's not my responsibility, like to fix this, to educate, to do this or that. You know, it's, um, you know, people were talking more about the um, dam property damage already, you know, than they were about the murder, you know, it's not, it's not my, it's not my job to explain to you why even that's a problem, <laughs> you know, um, you know, and I let other employees step up. I let them step up without my prompting because that's the kind of organization I'm developing, you know, that people from other communities could step up and speak truth and power. And so for me as a CEO, it, it was, it was less about the, the events of that day and the weeks afterwards but more the, the daily actions leading up to it and the daily actions after to craft, to, to, to hone an organization, you know, that breeds a culture that knows how to respond and knows how to uh, deal uh, with these issues. And part of the reason I started my own company was just so I could do things my own effing way. Like, I'm just being honest. Like, and all my employees know that. My employees, I tell them to their face, this is a dictatorship, it's not a democracy. Like you don't have a choice, you know, but for the company to operate this way and it will be equitable, you know, it will be diverse, it will be this, it will be that. And I'll, t I'll tell you, you can't hire someone. Like, I don't care if it's illegal. You're not hiring that person because you know what? We got too many of those persons already. So, I mean, that for me, that's why I love entrepreneurship because you can do whatever you, whatever you want. Well, thank you, Thompson. Thank you, Wokey, Al, Tony, Tony. You. This has been amazing. Um, I know I really appreciate your time for being a part of this panel. Conversations like this are exhausting in general. So I, I know this is you know, not easy to have and I really appreciate you know, sharing your perspectives uh, and experiences in the workplace, um, in life. I think hopefully the audience has gotten a lot out of this, um, just kind of some good nuggets. Um, this has been recorded. We will be providing a video link uh, with uh, the recording after this event for all those who have registered. We will also be providing a survey. We would love your feedback on this. Um, this is not just a one time thing that we're doing. We have this identity series and we're going to continue that. Uh, so we'll appreciate your feedback. And once again, Thursday is our last career month event. Um, it's the Maroon and Gold Connections event. We encourage you to register for that event so you can build connections with people like these you know, panelists here uh, and keep those going. Um, so thank you once again for your time today and uh, have a good rest of the day. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Tony. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>